Hello, welcome back to Tab U. My name's Katrina. I'm joined by Nick from Tab and Emma Hall from Move and Legal. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Nick, again. Sure. Nick Russell, Sales Director of Tab. Emma? Yes, I'm, I'm Emma Hall from Move and Legal and I'm their Key Relationships Director. Uh, same format as last time. It's the top five question you guys have been asking and this time it's on convincing. Uh, we'll kick things off with question number one. <laughs> Go what on. is conveyancing? What is conveyancing? Um, right, so basically, if you want to get the boring bit first, it is the legal transfer of land from one owner to the other owner. Um, so that is what it is. Um, it does have bricks and mortar on it as well. One one sort of interesting thing that I think you will find about conveyancing is the land is more important than actually what is built on the land. Um, so we'll probably come into it in a little while about freehold and leasehold, but that there is a difference into how it's done. One's easier to do than the other, but it is the legal transfer of title between owners. Um, and that can be whether it's a limited company, it can be whether it's an individual, it can be an individual to a limited company, it doesn't matter who's in the transaction, mm -hmm. it is just the transfer of the land. Um, and it can be with or without a mortgage. You don't have to have a mortgage. And that, I guess that happens every time a property purchase goes, like it, it has to happen then. Yes, yeah. it has to happen. What happens is every property since, I believe, it's either 76 or 79. It's one of the years my husband was born. We were born in one and I was born in the other. <laughs> no, it's one of those years where I get confused. Um, property has to be registered at Land Registry. Um, so now what we are, we're in 2000, oh, 2021. Um, most property in the UK now is registered. So basically you could actually go on and you can pay and buy office copies to a property. Mm -hmm. I've just seen a property I really like. It's derelict. It's definitely not been lived in for a while. So I have been on and bought the office copies to see who owns it and to see what's on there to see whether I can maybe it would be a good development project. <laughs> I might have to talk to you guys actually to see if you want to come in on it. Um, so yeah, that everything is registered and it will be down to who owns the property. Mm -hmm. It will be down to what mortgages you've got on the property. It can be down to restrictions. So I know I had a property in the past where the restrictions, I couldn't keep pigs and I couldn't blow up helium balloons. Well, where oh, they I wouldn't buy them. Yeah, that, that put <laughs> That's me That's off on. limits for me. Yeah, that, Forget that was it. it. Can't blow I mean, helium balloons. If you go back to very, very old property, they did have restrictions like that that are still there on the title. It's can fun. you get those yeah. restrictions removed? or? Um, yeah, you probably could. Now, then, You're not going to get them enforced. Now, I think if you look at the pig one, that was probably back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, <laughs> where people did put pigs in the gardens and people didn't want it. So you do see, see some weird and wonderful stuff. But sorry, but ultimately, mm -hmm. with land registry, yeah, you know, especially for you, you want to check for your client that the mm -hmm. person who is selling the property to your client or vice versa yeah. is the person who's actually registered as the owner. I mean, it's the you know that is the first and foremost that there's no fraud or any yeah anything like that going it's, on. Broad is a big topic at the moment, and it's something us as a business with our brokers are going to be covering a lot more. Um, I have seen property that's been fraudulently transacted, up, transacted on. Um, as a lawyer, if you do have a suspicion that there is, you raise it to you've got what's called a culp, and they're your compliance officer. If they've then still got a suspicion, there is an outside body that you can actually report the transaction to. And they will either come back to you and say, yep, it's fine, they can come back to you and say, yes, it's fine, but you're a tiny part in a bigger picture. You could spook out in a bigger investigation we've got and you will be left potentially to complete it and move it through. Um, wow. So it can happen. Um, I've seen it happen on buy-to-let property where the tenant remortgaged the property from the landlord and he came back and he had an eviction notice from a different lender than he thought he had a mortgage with because it had been done so that's sort of the real importance with solicitors because what really annoys our brokers when the conveyances get involved is they've already done all the id for their fca purposes they've already done it with you so you've got it you're satisfied the solicitor comes across and they do it independent and people get very frustrated well i've already done this we, we do it for the lender so we are actually acting for the lender in that part to make sure because we don't know who's fraudulent in the chain. It might mm. not be the client. It could be somebody else within the chain. Yeah. So, And you don't... The way conveyancing is now, it's not your traditional high streets that face-to-face. -face. It is done remotely. 
Yeah. Also, you've got professional indemnity that has to be relied upon, right? So That's a hot potato. Topic. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> really you're not going to just take someone else's um, word no. for it. They've done it and then say, yes, I, you, know, I, you can rely on the fact that I've doubled and triple checked this for yeah. your benefit. It no. just doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And this is what I say to people that if it was you as a lender and it's fallen at the last hurdle with another lender, would you just pick up from there and give them the money? You wouldn't. You you go back to scratch. And yes, there are some documents that can be reused and you might take a viewpoint on it, but ultimately that is your responsibility. Um, there are a lot of conveyancing firms over the years because of PI's increase in costs have left the market, which is probably why it's such a busier market with the stamp duty at the moment that there's still as much transactions going through, but there's a lot less conveyances out there actually processing it. And you've got lawyers that are great at tech and some that aren't so great and the pandemic's highlighted that <laughs> question number two what is the difference between a solicitor and conveyancer so you can either be a fully trained solicitor or you can be a licensed conveyancer and they run under two separate trade bodies in in honesty i don't think there's any difference in the quality of the work between either or if anything a conveyancer just does conveyancing all day every day your solicitor might be multitasking doing a divorce mm -hmm. and popping off to do a traffic accident and then a conveyance so there, there can be that difference depending on the lawyer would a um, lawyer be more expensive um just through the nature of the length of the qualifications to become a, a lawyer overall is it similar no, it's similar you find a lot of law firms do have licensed conveyances as well as solicitors oh. so it, it's a mix um they're regulated differently so the solicitors are regulated by the law society and the sra so the solicitor regulatory authority i have to say that really slow <laughs> and then the council of the licensed conveyances do the licensed conveyances, so they are run by two separate trade bodies. They do audit different, um, so that there will be different levels of tests, etc. They do licensed conveyances. Um, I mean, I'm I'm not a trained conveyancer, but I have done conveyancing. So you will have staff that are supervised. Yeah. So I ran a caseload with a supervisor that signed off all of my work, and he was a licensed conveyancer. So you will find that an awful lot more in solicitor firms now because they're cheaper probably <laughs> and actually it is becoming more of a automated trained bit of a sausage factory it, it can be if it's easy transactions you're putting through when you start to work in the specialist market you don't really find the property special as well and you find problems and you find issues it tends yes. it tends to run in that sort of train yeah and i think ultimately as a, as a lender you know, that's you know we always say that is what we're asking our conveyances, our lawyers to do for us is mm. poke as many holes as you can and see where, what, if, if anything's, if it's too much, then let us know, right? We just need to understand what are the actual risks of this pro on this property. We're not trying to not lend. Lenders yeah. are there to lend realistically. Well, especially I think in the specialist lending market, they need to get money out the door and want to get money out the door particularly. I question the high street banks, but <laughs> you know, but ultimately they're there to say, look, how much risk is there and are these risks something that we can look beyond mm. and something we can mitigate with maybe it's, whether it's indemnity policies or a multitude of other things that we might take a view on because we've seen these things before. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I think people misconceive sometimes and we'll maybe go on to that with brokers, misconceive actually the relationship between the lender and lawyer or conveyance yeah. and solicitor. I think ultimately if you just do it in the most simplest terms, the lawyer's job is to make sure you as the lender have got clear marketable title should you have to go in and repossess it. Because you need to turn that round and want to turn that round quickly to get your investment back. But it's also looking after the client to make sure when they go to sell on, they've got an easy clear marketable so it should go through. So the solicitors have the responsibility for the both. And I think that's why in the specialist market, you see more what we call SEP rep. So... Yep. You will have your lawyer looking after you. The client will have their lawyer looking after them. And basically your lawyer marks the client lawyer mm -hmm. to make sure they've done a good enough job for you. Um, you tend to find those cases are quite strained because you've got one lawyer telling another lawyer we don't like the work you've done. And a lot of arguments will often ensue because lawyers, they all have a different standard in how they work. Mm. Um, and one lawyer might say, well, no, I don't want to do that search. I don't think they need it. But you're saying, no, we want that search. Yep. And then I've, I've seen cases argue for two, three weeks and not move over one £30 search. Mm -hmm. And it had to be done in the end. It, it, yep. it wasn't going to budge. It couldn't be indemnified. It had to be done. But there was a three-week argument about this one £30 search. 
So yeah, and I think stressful. this is a really interesting topic. And I think particularly for any brokers listening, finance brokers in particular, who I think they get infuriated at this at this stage of the transaction mm. where you're like, why do lawyers, age old question, never just pick up the phone to each other? <laughs> Maybe you can shed some light on that because I think that there mm. is, you know, look, my job as sales director is to originate our loans and hopefully work with underwriting to get deals through. And sometimes I just literally, I'll arrange the call or I'll get underwriting to arrange a call between both sets of lawyers and the broker because I think it can be a very frustrating moment when you've got, look, we all know that as well that lawyers aren't just working on your case. They've got 10, 15, 20 other cases in the background that are all just as important Mm -hmm. as the one that you think they should be working on for you. But ultimately a phone call sometimes can, instead of this email jostling, that yeah. seems to take so long and could speed the market up, speed deals up. And if actually you mm. brought it out across so many, you know, across the market, it could speed a lot of things up. If you'd have asked me this question pre-pandemic to now, the answer would probably be very, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, the the way we work, we encourage and we've got SLAs with our lawyers that we want our online portal that we call it updated. And we encourage our brokers, go and put it on there. We can monitor it. We see when the message has gone on. We can see if the message hasn't been replied to. Then we get on it and we deal with it for the broker. Um, The phone thing, I I don't know. I mean, if you ever, and I I always encourage this with staff that I've worked with, go and spend a day with one of our lawyers. And I've actually done this with some of our lenders. Come and spend a day with a lawyer. I'll find you one. And 99 times out of 100, I get, wow, we didn't realise how much work they actually have to do and how much paper and is involved in mm-hmm. it. And that actually always makes the relationship better because there's an understanding. Um, I have noticed through, and this is no criticism because everyone can't be a jack of every single trade. You specialise in what you do. But there's a real lack of understanding of the conveyancing process from the moment you find the property you like and do your quote to the moment you get your keys. The process is quite lengthy and it can be quite tedious and certain areas will take more time and I know we'll go into searches at some point there's no point one of our lawyers chasing a local authority for a search when they've been told we're on 75 days at the moment it doesn't matter how many times they ring they are in that queue for that search and should the lender want to take indemnity okay that would speed it up but should maybe an automated message go out to the client say we've not forgot you or should a proper explanation be given early on to say right your counsel's taken 75 days there is nothing we can do mm-hmm. so we're going to park it now that is really frustrating of course. Um, but at the moment you've got i think it's over 400 local authorities they don't all work on the same computer system yeah so be it a lawyer if you instructed us today give me your money i'll hit send i've ordered your search it can be done by the lawyer that quickly um, but then it's when you order the searches that you come into that as well. The, you want the contracts mm-hmm. because then you don't know what you're ordering because you haven't got the information from the seller to confirm this is what you're buying. Yeah. So there's there's lots of clunks. It's probably still quite an old-fashioned system. It is. And also, if you're dealing with a home purchaser, you're dealing with a lot of emotion that maybe the lawyer's not got because you're objectively looking at just a property for your client. Yep. Whereas that person has spent how many months, years, saving you know, building equity in their house, working really hard, finding the dream property, and it all hinges on this transaction to happen when they need it to happen. Yep. And I suppose you're looking at, you know, as a, as a lawyer, convincing lawyer, you're, you've probably got m- pretty much most of the time a quite objective view. There's not really mm-hmm. much emotional attachment to any of these properties other than the fact you want to do a good, really good job for your client and make sure they get what they need. So you're probably always juggling that emotional from one side to what's actually achievable yeah, and workable on the other side. That's what I spend most of my job doing. I stay quite emotive and I sit on, they all say to me, you sit on the fence. I said, well, no, I'll listen to lender, client, broker and then figure out what the problem is and then fix it. And it is very emotive. And I think it was before Christmas, so the stamp duty holiday had started. We were all wondering, were we going to have Christmas, not have Christmas, see family, not see family, wanting to move before the Christmas deadline. Um, it was like month end every day and you guys know what I mean by month end and for anyone watching that doesn't it is the busiest day of your month Um, and literally all you do on that day is completions and you physically often cannot do 
someone's mortgage offer that might have just come in because you've got all these completions that have to go by three yep. o'clock. Um, so it's, it is quite a juggling and no one knew how much work this stamp duty holiday was going to bring, not going to bring. Then teams went off with COVID. Mm-hmm. Lenders went off with COVID. Lenders worked from home. Solicitors were working from home. Just all a little bit chaotic yep. and it was closed for two months. The amount months. of documents that got sent to solicitors' offices with no staff there to take those documents in. Yep, and that is part of the problem. I mean, I mean wet signatures are still the majority of the market and I know back in pre this is probably before your time for you two this is going to really depress me credit crunch 2007 no. um I was alive <laughs> <laughs> you were alive great <laughs> um and I think we talked about this when we last met um it was very much going down the route because there was lots of money in the market to go electronic and everyone was just going to touch the button yeah done brilliant now some lenders are doing that mm-hmm. but you're looking at your big corporate high street banks with very a-list clean clients yep. and the rest of the market will come along um but you need land registry you need everyone within that chain to do it with you mm. and to get everybody on one page i mean they've been trying for 20 years to have or longer a system where we all talk on so client a state agent broker you yep. and we all talk on this one hub and many many millions has been spent and it's not been cracked that's a lot of people to it's interesting and would you want it all on one database and then you get hacked anyone using that sort of system um there are a few out there what's the system called Um, i'm interested have to find out for you um because it's one of these things that pops up on the radar drops off pops up drops Mm -hmm. off and then something else happens in the property market and everyone forgets so there are in there so i'll get that over to you but how much does convincing cost (sighs) well this massively varies um you can get conveyancing very, very cheap for a few hundred. You can get it very expensive. Traditionally, costs always really been based on location. So the further north you go, the cheaper it is because your office space, your staff space, your living costs are lower. Closer you get into central London, southeast, you can be seeing double the price. Um, I won't go into what our quotes are because they do change. Um, our lawyers change it based on staffing um the, the way we work's a little bit different but our recommendation is don't just look at cost and i think that's the biggest fail that people do um they go for the cheapest one mm-hmm. every time i always say well maybe look a bit more middle of the table um use your broker mm-hmm. talk to your broker because your broker's likely to have a relationship with a conveyancer or a client that's recommended talk to friends family anyone actually a recommendation will be probably better Mm. um with brokers we say actually it's savvy to partner up with a law firm or a panel manager partner up with someone because you can build a relationship you know how they work our lawyers will talk to a client's broker Mm -hmm. um we've actually just had a case move over to us and the lawyer basically emailed the broker back and went i don't have to talk to you so i'm not going to (laughs) that that was pretty much the (laughs) end of end of the email um And in essence, that is true. They're not acting for the broker. They don't have to talk to the agent. They don't have to talk to anyone that they're not working for. They do it as an additional, it makes their life easier. Um, our lawyers will deal with the brokers. So how does moving legal work for in kind of this scenario? Then would mm. the broker come to you guys to say, I need a lawyer for a convincing project down the line? Yep. Can you help? We have a mix. So we've got an online portal that they'll go on to. And they can quote anything from a remortgage to a purchase to a bridge, commercial, anything, they'll put it in. When it comes to specialists, we do have a team of EDMs. And what we encourage, yes, you can go and get the quote off the system, which unless you come to me with something really quirky, we might change, you can. However, we see the quotes have been done. We spot that they're bridges. We spot that they're commercial. We then speak to the broker. Because then the broker will say to us, it's got to go next week. And I look at the lawyer and go, no, they've got someone on maternity leave. That might not. Mm. You, there's a presumption yeah. that once it lands on the desk, that is the only file that you've got Correct. that will go within that week. So we will then speak to our lawyers and say, look, this is a scenario. Can you do it? And some of them will say, yep. Yeah. Some will say, look, really sorry next time, but I'm going to let myself down, let you down, broke a client, etc." So when it comes, we, we treat it different. When it's your vanilla work, and we've got sections they can tell us all the quirky stuff, but when it comes to bridge commercial, no, we have to talk to the 
broker because it's never quite what's on the instruction once you start to delve into yeah, it. Yeah, you can have a, a commercial with a lease, a sublease, a head lease, the freeholder. Next thing you know, you've got four levels of title. You've got yeah. different leaseholders. You've got all sorts of th- I mean... And then they want to so split the title. Yeah. And that, that's an easy job, Because, oh, isn't I need it? a and piece of land on the side. That I think I'm going to go for resi planning. And, you know, I need to go through that. And then it's got oh, but it's got a restriction. And then the next thing you know, there's the you know the lack of access through that part of the land. And yeah. it's not just... I understand what you're saying. And with the changes in HMO properties as well, which there are more of, and what they need for regulation and planning and council. And a, a lot of people, they've yeah. not done anything for a long time. They don't know that this is what they've had to do. And it varies... So for you to have a license, it varies the amount, maximum amount of units for you to then cross over to get a license to different boroughs, doesn't it? So I've you have to li- check each borough, each area. Yeah. Yeah. And this is what the lawyers have to do manually because oh they, they have to they have to go in and actually do this. And I mean, I've, I'm actually now having an email <laughs> conversation with someone about this because there's a discrepancy between what the lawyer thinks and the client thinks and the broker thinks and the council. Oh so they're all saying something Shock. a little bit. So it's a bit, <laughs> and I've just opened the email as we walked in here and I thought, that's one for later. <laughs> That's going to take me quite a while to sort of go through. But yeah, it, it doesn't. Again, it's like we touched on the searches. Yeah. You could get a search in some councils in four or five days. The longest at the minute is 175. So you've got a bit of a gap. Jeez. And then you get the ones in the middle. So we 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 do get to see how long searches take. Six months, um, some, some places take it. Unfortunately, that council was hacked. And it was, oh, no. it was Hackney Council. So they were hacked. A bit unfortunate with the name, name as well, nature, so yeah. and that that's all that's always been my concern about us talking about having these centralized databases. Imagine if every local authority was centralized on one database and they were hacked, yeah, yeah, it's a problem. That could be the whole industry waiting six months for research. Yeah, now, true. I'm sure something would have to be done on mass if it was done on that scale, but that there is that concern. So, touching on the searches, what are they? Where do they come in the process? Who does them? Well, yeah. councils. How much they cost? Do they vary between councils? Councils. Yeah. Is it usually the same price? People work differently, so you tend to find you sort of more high street lawyer will charge for the searches as they go along. Um, the way we work, we charge one fee, and then that is their fee for the transaction. Um, we actually have a policy that if it falls through for certain reasons, the insur- searches are insured, so we get their next searches for them without them paying yeah. again. Um, so people work differently. Um, it, t- it tends to balance out some areas. There's not much of a difference with how they work. And this this is a bit of an area for argument at the moment, particularly with how long searches are taking. Traditionally, once you've instructed a lawyer, they do the compliance checks to make sure at this point that they're comfortable with you. They'll get your money on account for the searches. You then fill in your terms of business. Until that lawyer has that terms of business signed, they generally won't act because they've not been instructed. Mm-hmm. And then their insurance wouldn't cover them by not signing up for the terms. At that point, they will wait for contracts. And the reason we touched on was they will send the map of the land. And that will confirm whether they do have these sneaky bits of land around the edges of it. Um, They can go on and get office copies and order it earlier. However, if they do that and the office copies are wrong that they've got from the registry and then the contract arrives, that client will have to pay more money because you'll have to redo Mm -hmm. what you've done. Um, So you, you are reliant on the seller giving in the contracts. Um, and then the seller's solicitor is reliant on the seller giving them all the information to draw up the contracts. So that can either be quick. So it's really dependent on the seller how quick those searches can be done. Because as soon as contracts land, searches are ordered, that's fine. Okay. Can I just jump in on something? Mm -hmm. When you get the boundary map, how often and how do you mitigate where maybe the next door neighbour or the the owner, current owner, has built outside of their land yeah and you know that's a risk of enforcement they'd have to return the property back yeah. there's established use come into it i mean what how often does that happen and what are the mitigated how can you mitigate right. that if you think you found the prop right property and all of a sudden you realize that person's built three foot over their boundary they've, yeah. they've actually built too much the extension is you know 500 square foot bigger than they were actually allowed to do on the originally yeah. original planning three years ago Oh, I had to move a neighbour's fence somewhere I had. <laughs> and she argued with me that that was her boundary and I bought out my office copies and went, nope, and moved the fence. Because um, <laughs> she was trying to take off mine. To be fair, I had a really big front garden and she had a tiny one, so that's probably what she was trying to do. Um, you, you're covered in sort of several areas and everyone really has the responsibility for this. So one, we are relying on the valuer that's gone out and yeah. done the job because that is for them to map and do. You are relying on the seller being honest 
that if they they're going to know if someone's built onto the land or done something they shouldn't do and they are asked that in what's called a ta6 form so they are asked do you have any problems with neighbors disputes is there anything that shouldn't so they have to do it so if they don't they're liable they've lied it's then up for our clients lawyer or the person buying for them to do their checks so again they're relying on the valuer to ride on the seller solicitor telling them the truth a lot of lawyers now google maps google maps is used a lot because they can go on and actually look at the map look at the plan and can actually see i have known lawyers to find problems on google maps and actually go back to the valuer and actually find that actually yes that shouldn't be there so i have seen it happen okay. um how often not that often no. and to be honest with you if it came up often it's something that as a business for us it would land on my desk because everyone will go into panic about what <laughs> yeah. to do because um, that's going to cost more money etc I've had one recently where there was a dispute. Um, it did take longer. And if they're going to dispute it, yeah, it's going to add on. But it, it's a mixture of everybody. But it, I think, to be honest, it is really reliant on the seller being honest. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question number four. How long does convincing take? Okay. Obviously, we've touched on... I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> and again... If you'd have asked me at different times, it's different answers. And we've just put together a conveyancing course for our brokers that CPD accredited them to have. And it is to explain the process and how it works and how long it takes, because that's the biggest complaint. We've got the search money. Can it not just go in like two weeks? No, <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so pre-pandemic for a freehold property, you probably look about 12 weeks turnaround and that's that's not just the conveyance we're talking from the moment they're instructed for the mm -hmm. mortgage offer coming in yeah all of that 12 now at the moment you're probably looking at more like 16 to 18 weeks because you've got the increase in the local councils you've got the lenders taking longer the solicitors everybody i don't think and there are a lot of arguments on twitter on this and i try not <laughs> to get too involved there's a lot of yeah, sure. argument <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not arguments at all there are a lot of arguments as to whose fault it is in the chain it's no one's fault at the moment it mm. is actually just what it is yes it's highlighted across the chain technology could be utilized a lot better in parts of it however i still stand by in the specialist market you do need that human interaction at some point you, you can't have it as the button brush leasehold traditionally would have taken you about your 16 weeks they're probably taking over 20 and again in a leasehold you're chucking in a managing agent or a landlord Mm. And I'm, I know the block of flats we lived in, as soon as COVID was announced, our concierge, my binman, that does the grounds, packed up and went home. And I was sort of like, well, what's going to happen for the next two months with the bins? They were back within 24 hours. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't, but they literally went. So it's, they're Out taking Twitter. longer. <laughs> um, I, I didn't have to get involved in that, though I am now on the committee for our residents association <laughs> for the legal section. And I didn't realise I'd signed up to it till the husband threw me under the bus. And I was like, who's this woman? What, what is this I'm doing? And he goes, oh, yeah, I've signed you up for the committee. Meetings are at 8 o'clock every Thursday morning. I'm like, oh, wow. wow. Oh, Thanks. my God. I don't do it before 10 most days. <laughs> this is not good. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I think, and this is a personal opinion rather than a company opinion, I can't see us returning back to pre-pandemic consistently time scales till the beginning of quarter two next year. Um, and we all moaned about those timescales pre this. We're all going to be made up by quarter two because it's quicker. And I, the, the reason being is the second stamp duty holiday is coming up. You then have your traditional Christmas. Then everyone has that two week break. You come back, you clear up in January, and then you start to build up your pipeline yeah. for Easter, mm -hmm. May bank holiday. You go. So I think it's going to take a while. As long as we don't have another lockdown or stop, um, it's going to take a little while to get back to where we all were not just lawyers i think mm. ev everyone in the chain is there any way to speed up that process mm. by well money yeah i mean by money speed up the process <laughs> create the pro um, create the platform right you you can i'm um, lawyers you can bypass waiting for the contracts for the searches if you want the lawyer more likely have you sign a disclaimer to say They've advised you that this might cost you more money, so you can do that. So some people will do that. Um, you really, if you've got a good broker, them actually helping the client fill in the paperwork, get the identification over to your certified, make sure the client returns it. I mean, 
even in lockdown, you've got a horrible habit. I do it myself. I get the post Monday through to Friday, stick it on the table, think I'll do that at the weekend. Well, there's a week gone. Mm-hmm. If I'd have just not sat down and watched, I don't know, I'm a bit obsessed with them legal their own at the moment, but if I'd, have not, <laughs> if I'd have used that hour to actually complete it on the Monday night and yeah. send it in. So you do, you do have the habit, paperwork sits there. Yeah. Um, and when that paperwork's returned, everybody wanted to act on that moment. Of course. And it's all well, okay. They, they'll still act with it in their normal time frame, but it probably could have been done quicker. So that the client's a big factor. Yeah, we get that all the time. Right, the yeah. client, clients will sit, will have sent paperwork over for signing, will have sent facility letters, done everything, and then a week go by, 10 days, two weeks, then we'll, then we'll get a call from the broker. They've just gone in and signed the paperwork. Can we draw down tomorrow? I'm like, <laughs> sorry? I thought the deal was dead, to be honest. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's, but, you know, it, that can be holiday season as well. So we tend to find a lot of problems with the summer holidays and Christmas. Um, People do go on holiday. Mm. Um, you know, it is it is a little bit tougher during that time because people are away. So, you know, if you're going to go on your three-week break and you know you've got the paperwork coming, maybe get an email to you, maybe, I don't know, or be happy to wait your three weeks mm. and know that you potentially have lost those three weeks. You might you might not always lose it. Um, yeah. We allowed video calling, to be honest, um, mm. and signature over video calling as long as it was uh, confirmed and written witnessed by their own solicitor. Yeah. We've got a lot of our lawyers are doing that at the moment. Yeah. Um, what's quite interesting, when lawyers started to do this, it was very much this is a temporary measure. It's mm. temporary, it's temporary. No. Um, I think now that it, people have become more comfortable with it and now clients are saying, well, why should I come into the office? I could have yeah. done, I did this over the phone before. What's the difference now? Yeah. You, you do tend to find it's a little bit different, though. If you do have repeat clients, buy-to-let landlords, etc., it does change the compliance a little bit because they've got the same solicitor. So they're still doing the same job. But they've already, you've all got that relationship mm. already. Um, so, and just one thing on timescales is the one thing people do or borrowers get worried about is um, their mortgage offers expiring. Yeah, I think I've just touched a nerve. You have touched a nerve. <laughs> Can you? Because most of them are three months. Mortgage offers are three um, months. Are banks pl- being a bit more sensible and s- extending those offers for longer? So you know, um, I've I've noticed that one, it really is on a case by case basis. Um, I think what you've got to look at, and lenders obviously don't tell us this information, but we have had furlough. Um, we have had client circumstances change. If it's changed, the lawyer needs to be told because they need to inform the lender. So when you do that completion call and go, oh, it's been great, I've been on furlough, but you've got them down as fully employed, full-time working, you yeah. right, okay. It, it's that. So I think lenders have scrutinised more. Um, yes, I've seen offers being extended maybe more than once. So traditionally, most of your main ones would mm. be a two-week extension. But really only if the lawyer said, I can realistically do it in those two weeks. They don't just do it for the sake of it. You've got to be confident. But just like with the search is taking so long, right? Let's say you said they can take yeah. up to how many weeks, Matt? Um, that counsels six weeks. However, some of the lenders on those ones did start to indemnify Fine. as a one-off. Okay. And they didn't want it put out in public domain that they yeah, were well, doing I'm it. Fair, fair, fair um, but they did on those ones because that was exceptional circumstances. To do those policies, though, the lawyer still has to buy the search. And these have to be seen to make every effort to get the search in for the policy to, to be there. So how long do the, long do the search, searches last? Six months. So they last fine. So they okay. last six months. So from the day the search is done, that lasts six months. Fine. You get little searches within the transaction that only last you two weeks, a month. Um, <laughs> bankruptcy you, searches, you just and bankruptcy like that, searches. Yeah. Priority to make sure no one else is putting finance on your property. So. You'll get that. That's there. that's done right at the end, though, right? You do that on the um, day of completion, or take what, a few days before. What you'll find is a lawyer will do it probably twice in the transaction, at least. So, I mean, I know when I had my caseload, I would do it early on mm-hmm. to make sure at that stage that there weren't any problems, because mm-hmm. um, you're relying on the client telling you. Often back in the day, and I mean this was quite a while ago, you'd find a lot of clients had bankruptcy discharged, but they didn't know they had to pay a pound to get it removed from the name and send the certificate <laughs> off. So we'd wait till completion. See it, client would panic, I've not got my certificate, what do we do? You'd miss completion. Um, so I, I did it, and a lot of our lawyers will do it early on to double check. Okay. And then you do it at the end to yeah, make sure fine. nothing's happened in that. How many interim. searches do you do in one process, do you reckon? Oh, it depends All on the part. property. So you always do your local, your water, your environmental. So there you're sort of like three core. Um, you always do your bankruptcies and your priority for you guys as well. Um, you can do coal search a tin mining search which is common in 
Devon Cornwall mm. um, brine search, which I think is up in Cheshire. You can do what's called a chancel search. Yes. Um, what is a chancel search? Chancel search. I've always had this that. Is, <laughs> this is this is the one everyone argues Because everyone's like, about. what is his word? Everyone argues Chance about it. Spell, Basically, has it spell? the way to describe it is you live in an area where you might have a church or a green around it, and you're all responsible for the upkeep. So you could all of a sudden get a letter from the church saying, we need to fix the roof, we want 100 quid donation from you. So you've got a level, and, and it's part of your property lease that you have to do it. Never noticed one have a problem. If I'm just honest. So that because the church used to always or was the largest landowner in the country and just most of it was ended up being, most yeah. houses ended up being built on and, some sort of church land. Yeah, and English law is very old. Yeah. I mean, we, we were looking at a property last night and it is a church courtyard and it's built in the church ground next to the graveyard, which I was like, mm, this is nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, but I, Halloween. Was like, <laughs> I, I was, I said, we would have to do a chancel and I said, there is a risk because it's a freehold property, so it's not leasehold, but I said they they could be in that title of that property that we do have to do some level of contributing. So you'd want to know about it buying, um, and your lender will want to know, because if it's extortionate cost, yeah. that's not been built into your factor of... How do you it. know what searches to do for what property, or is it just something that you have knowledge of? Is it written down? It's like if this... Both, really. It's, it's clever computer systems with our lender providers. Mm -hmm. So our lender providers, we go to them with where the property is and then they tell us what searches that you need to get. Yeah. Um, it might be something gets thrown up on a search which makes you want to go and buy another search no one knew about. Um, but it's that, that part of the system. Other than the fact they're having to go off and deal with third parties, we do have the providers that package and do everything for us. Back in the day, you had to do it all yourself. You'd be going off to every which direction. Yeah, you used to have a little book for coal authority, and you used to have to go through, get your code, go to a little computer in the corner of the room, type it, and get the oh, yeah, it's it's definitely moved on. <laughs> just a little. Yeah, just a little. Hey, well, I didn't know there were so many. That's for sure. But mm. there you go. Are they the are they the worst? The thing of the process. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're the ones people focus on and stress about more than any other point in the transaction. It, it is, and it's because it's the one everyone's got the least control over. Um, and that that is the thing. The yeah. broker has a level of control over the lender and working with you. They have a level of control over their client to get them in action. They've got a level of control over the lawyer because you're paying for service. Um, the, the searches, a, a lot of the control, you, you are in someone else's mm. hands. Well, there you go. Mm. Question number five. Yep. Question number five. How can I choose a <clears throat> conveyancer? Oh, well, I think we sort of touched yeah. on this a bit before, didn't we? That um, I, I, I'll always say for recommendation, mm -hmm. I would always say have a, if, for, for a broker, always have a few lawyers that you can go to. Don't just pick one because mm -hmm. you are going to have that day where that lawyer can't do the case for you. And then you're going to just be this little homeless <laughs> broker not knowing where to go. Um, also probably as well, building the relationship so, I mean, we have a great relationship with our brokers. All our staff are trained in being able to help with conveyancing. They can have a sensible conversation with us. Try and find a company that's actually interested in helping get your case complete, not just take your instruction. And that's sort of the biggest thing at the moment. You can pile instructions into your heart's content thinking, be a great amount of money in the bank afterwards. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing a good job and not doing it quick enough, then it's Doesn't it's matter. not. So I would say brokers really should... And if, you, if you're a client, if you're a consumer, mm -hmm. ask your broker or ask friends and families. Do look at reviews online. Um, yep. Not all of them are true. <laughs> you do get some disgruntled clients. That it doesn't matter what you say to them. They're never going to be happy. Yep. But yeah, recommendation is the biggest. And I think for us brokers having a relationship that they can do, use. And other kind of key considerations you should like, we kind of mentioned that now it's all remote. So location, lo location, location <laughs> might have been a consideration back in the day. But now uh, is that such a thing? I think, I think if you come to your high street model, location for quite some time hasn't been as much of an issue because people have gone cost. Oh, I don't need to see you. That's great. Not a problem. That's cheaper. I'll go down that route. Specialist for many years did stick very much still to the face to face because it had to be. I mean, I, I've, for some of the law firms I've worked with, I've come out to meet clients face to face to do the face to face element with them and meet them in random places mm -hmm. to go and do everything. Um, I don't think location is as much of a concern 
now as it was moving forwards um whether that changes i think it's quite going to be quite hard for us to go back to start having clients go in because mm-hmm. i think your brokers are going to say well you were happy to do it for yeah. this long before what what's changed now give now, them an inch give them an inch that one one big tip i would give brokers is to be very careful looking at how many partners a law firm has so one are you happy to use a licensed conveyancer as a lender or do you want a law firm with sra partners mm-hmm. um have they got enough partners some lenders are happy with two sra some want three I had one yesterday that wanted five um which that threw me as well I was quite just strong like, that, that, very that, strong. That, that was quite strong yeah. um what would be so, the purpose behind that generally for a lender it's actually fraud mitigation of having uh more partners if you go to a one-man yeah. band the likelihood is there's no that that person in their own is not being checked and balanced mm-hmm. so at least having two sra registered partners uh gives you that slight more comfort that there are mm-hmm. you know there's not just one person running wild yeah mm-hmm. the, the more, and it has it has been known there have been I can't remember they called it something, but it would be they pick the big, busiest day of the year, set up fake email, fake letters, solicitor head, taken a load of deposit and lender money, and do a bunk. Mm-hmm. And that that has happened, and and checks have now been put into place. So we've now got something called lawyer checkers, where we can go in, check the lawyer, and it checks their banking activity in the background, and it will flag if anything. So mm-hmm. a lot of measures have been put in place, um, but it doesn't. It is it is to mitigate. The risk, the more you've got, yep. the safer you're deemed. M5 is just kind be. of a little unusual because that's just a a quite excessive. Yeah, yeah quite um, and, and for that, you have to really look at your bigger, larger law mm-hmm. firms. But it is making sure because what I tend to find, I do spend quite a bit of my time doing is the, and, and sometimes it, you can't be helped. You thought you were going to go with this lender. You're now going with this other lender that wants different SRA partners, but you're actually ready to nearly exchange. No lawyer will pick up a file like we discussed before from someone else. You want that's your new case. You want to start it. So we end up then going down the route of getting someone just to act for the lender, so we can speed it up. But then it does cost the client more money. Mm-hmm. The client has to pay for your lawyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So it is brokers being mindful of that, but it can be very hard if a lender changes. Thanks for joining us on Tabu. See you next time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. Bye. Peace.